So Nicky Horn is genuinely a radio legend. I think he has the unique honour of being the only presenter to have had regular shows on every national commercial radio station before DAB, as well as on the BBC, Radio 1 and Radio 2. He's done telly, quite a lot of telly, especially around sport. Four million people would watch him present Channel 4's American football in the 1980s. And he's still working. He has a fantastic show on the wonderful Boom Radio every afternoon. Nikki, it's a genuine pleasure and honour to meet you. It is um, lovely to meet you too. Well, I was a home service girl, really. I was raised as a home service with a bit of light programme, you know, musicals, mm -hmm. uh, waltzing around the kitchen with me mother, to, um, my fair lady. Um, but I did know about you because at some point I heard an amazing Kenny Everett trail about little Nicky Horn. It was brilliant. And I researched them this afternoon and here it is again, or at least here's one of them. Little Nicky Horn is a groovy scene. Know what we mean. Out of his bean. Your mother may not like it much. That brings back so many happy memories. I, what happened was we were both working at Capital Radio at the time because we first met at Radio 1 when he was at Radio 1. That was before he was fired from Radio 1 and I was working as Emperor Roscoe's roadie. That's where we first met. But when we were at Capital together, we all used to have little um, pigeonholes, little cubby holes, where uh, pluggers would put new records in and post would go into it and you know we'd, we'd go in there every day and just take out the records and occasionally there would be a tape cartridge these are a bit like eight track carts but they were professional um, tape cartridges that had jingles on and occasionally you would go to the, this um, pigeonhole and you would find this cartridge in there tape cart and it ha would have the most beautiful calligraphy writing on it and it would say dearest Nikki little prezzy for you love Ken kiss 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 and then you would put it in the machine and you would hear that incredible jingle absolutely and, and when you think that he did that with primitive equipment you know analog equipment three tape recorders and he would harmonize with himself and he just, you know, occasionally th these tapes would appear and it was the most wonderful thing. He, he was an incredible man. He really was an incredible human being. And an incredible radio person. And I wondered what, you know, as a lad, what kind of a lad were you? What drew you to radio? Well, really, it was Radio Luxembourg, as it was for so many of us boomers, you know, listening under the bedclothes um, <laughs> with my... Uh, earpiece into a little transistor. My dad, I remember when I was about eight or nine, my dad bought a huge Russian made radio, a military radio that he got from, you know, one of those mail order companies. And it was massive, this thing. It was like a, you know, small fridge. Um, and it had all these shortwave bands on it. Um, and I remember in my bedroom in Palmer's Green in North London, you know, picking up these most amazing sort of sounds. Sometimes it was just, you know, shortwave voices coming in and out of the radio. Um, and that was my first love of radio. And then it was the Pirates. It was listening to Kenny Everett on Radio London, particularly the pirate ship Radio London, listening to Kenny and Cash. And I so wanted to go out there. It sounded so wonderfully romantic. Um, I was slightly too young, though, to go on to the Pirates. I did try an audition for Radio Caroline later, um, but uh, they wouldn't have me. But it was, it was Radio Luxembourg, the shortwave radio, that introduced me to the most amazing sounds from around the world. I could, I could travel the world from my bedroom with this thing. And then Radio London that just, I remember when Radio London closed down.
big L closed down. I mean, I cried. It was, it was. What is it about mortified. radio that tore at your heart in that way? Because I know that sense of intimacy myself. Um, I think it was that actually that sense of intimacy and the fact that I could, I could travel around. So I would, and, and hear all these amazing sounds that I wasn't hearing on the BBC at the time. So I could tune in to American Forces Network and I could hear R&B and soul and blues. You know, this was, this was a whole new world that had opened up to me musically. Um, and I wasn't getting any of that on, you know, the Dear Old Life programme. Um, and, and that's what fed my love for it. And I also love the idea of you know the pirates you know bobbing around in this on this boat in the north sea and listening and listening to someone like you know john peel late at night um and you know that intimacy that he could build with me alone in my bedroom you know he was talking to me just me and he was playing me music um that's where my love for radio started really and how did you get in? Because it's not easy, even in those days when <laughs> perhaps it was easier. Um, I was I was very lucky. Um, I uh, I met a record plugger. I used to hang around in Soho in London, uh, the recording studios, and um, I'd I'd meet musicians there, um, and I'd go to the pubs and the coffee bars and all that. And I met a record plugger, who gave me. I said, look, I really want to go to Radio 1. Um, I want to go into the studios at Radio 1. And um, he drew me a map on a, um, on a napkin of how to get from the uh, broadcasting house up the stairs, which I, you know very well, the, uh, the staircase, the big windy staircase, and into the control room. Um, and then into the cons, which were the Radio uh, One uh, studios. And he drew me this map. And so one Sunday afternoon, and this is God's honest truth, one Sunday afternoon, I was about 17, and I had this map. And I walked into Broadcasting House, and I said hello to the commissioner. There was no, this was long before the days of, you know, security and passes and stuff. Waved to the commissioner, you know, hello, good afternoon, as if I sort of owned the place. And then with this map, I went up the stairs, along the main corridor on the first floor, knew where to turn right into the main control room, past the TOM's office, you know, the technical operations manager and Atom, Tom and Atom, uh, the assistant technical operations manager, and then went into um, the cons. And there was Alan Freeman uh, rehearsing for Pick of the Pops. And I said to him, hello, uh, my name's uh, Nicky Behorn. I used the B in my middle name at that point. I said, I, I'm a sort of trainee DJ. You know, can I, can I come and watch you? And Fluff went, not off, mate. Uh, sit down there. And for the next, I suppose, six months or so every sunday i would sit behind fluff there were quite a few of us actually and what did you learn from fluff i learned that the, the sort of the technical side of it the way that he operated all the machinery was almost like a ballet i mean it was it was a it was beautiful to watch him work because you know there were so many elements that he was bringing into the program I think what I learned about Fluff also was brevity. That he could say in just a few words what other people were saying in two or three sentences. You know, everything was very carefully um, calibrated. His speech was beautifully calibrated. I think that's what I learned from Fluff. Which, of course, is a great... I think warmth. underrated I mean, skill. Uh, amazing warmth. Fluff yeah. had the most incredible warmth that he could communicate through his microphone. But briefly, and that is a real skill in itself, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Often underestimated, I think. Yes. I think you, I mean, that was luck, but it was also boldness, <laughs> you know, and I love the idea that you just walk up the stairs, you know, given our current plights, you know, it's three layers of security now when you go into Broadcasting House. Indeed. Um, you had a bit of luck as well, didn't you, with, um, I think, Emperor Rosca at Radio 1. Tell me about that. Yes, well, this goes back to Kenny Everett again, um, because in those days I sounded like Kenny Everett, and I had recorded a demo tape for Radio 1, um, which was a double-headed show, me and a guy called Chris Grant. Chris used to do a lot of the voices for trails and promos at Radio 1. And he and I did this double-headed program um, called the Horner Grant Phonographic Company. And it, the conceit was that um, he was the sort of butler, and I it was Jeeves and Worcester, really. That was the whole idea. And I sounded like Kenny Everett. I had a very high voice at the time, hadn't really broken. My, you know, he was my, he was so much of my idol that I, um, I you know, mimicked him. And um, we ran up. We so we recorded this um, demo, but we had to record it in bits, and we ran out of money. So Chris, um, under cover of darkness, one night went into Egdon House, which was where uh, Radio 1 was housed at the time and he started to edit the tape out this private tape um, in what they used to call CTS1 which was the cassette transfer suite which was like the workshop at Radio 1. Anyway Roscoe was walking by on this Friday night getting prepared for his show on Saturday morning and he heard my voice and he said to Chris Grant, you know, who is that guy? He sounds just like Kenny Everett. Who is it? And Chris said, it's Nicky Bighorn. Um, and uh, Roscoe said, because at the time, Roscoe and Everett used to hand over to each other. And Everett always used to win the handovers. So Roscoe wanted someone who sounded like Everett to put Everett off his stride. So th that Friday night, I got a call from Chris, who said, Roscoe wants to see you now. Emperor Roscoe wants to see you now. And I went, y you're mad. And he went, no, no, no. He gave me the address, and it was a flat in West Kensington. I was in Palmer's Green, North London. I got in my mum's Mini, and I drove to West Kensington. I got there about 9 o'clock at night, 9, 10 o'clock at night. And... Roscoe was there with his manager, Henry, a guy called Henry Henriot. Anyway, we had a chat and a drink, a couple of drinks, and Roscoe, just out of the blue, Roscoe said, would you like to be my assistant and roadie and come on the road with me? And I went, well, this came completely out of the blue. So I said, absolutely, I'd love to. Um, I was still living at home in my parents' place in Palmer's Green. I was 19. Um, I was, I had a place at Sussex to do English and drama. And I was on a year out. Um, I took a year out. Um, and then I moved out of my parents' place uh, about a week later. I moved into this rock and roll flat in West Kensington, where Roscoe had a studio, he had a proper studio there. There were f five bedrooms. It was, um, it was, it was a mad place. I mean, I so I came from a fairly sheltered northwest London Jewish background, and I saw stuff there that I had never seen. And Go on, I tell loved, us what you saw. I, I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. Um, it was. It was amazing. It was an amazing education. And Roscoe, and so I then would go into Roscoe's studio on a Saturday um, and help him sort of prepare the show. I would go on the road with him and I would, you know, warm up his gigs for him. And that's how I met Aidan Day, who was the one of the original uh, architects of Capital Radio. And that's really how I, I, I got in, because it, it, as you well know, Helen, this is all about, or in those days, it was about who you knew, and it was about luck, and it's, and it, I mean, everything is about luck and timing, uh, if you think about it. Um, but in those days, it was, it was even more about timing, and I just happened, by God's grace, good grace, 
to be in the right place at the right time. But you also knew it was what you wanted to do, didn't you? Oh, without I mean, a shadow. What comes through is the focus. Without a shadow of a doubt. Without a shadow of a doubt. But it, it wasn't because I was, I was pushy. Stuff just happened. Mm. Stuff just happened. I'm intrigued by the rock and roll lifestyle you entered from the sheltered North London Jewish home. Give us a few examples of what, what made your eyes widen. Um, <laughs> I have to be quite careful here um, uh, because, you know, there are, there are people still around. Um, uh, and, yeah, I have to be quite careful. Um, but let's just say that it was everything that Ian Dury ever said. It was sex and drugs and rock and roll. All right, I'll, I'll give you one example. For my 21st birthday, when I was living with Roscoe, Roscoe bought me a waterbed, a double waterbed. Yeah, I think we've got the Get picture. It? Got it, right. I think we've got the picture. What did your mum think about that, Nick? My mother didn't like it. <laughs> I bet she didn't. <laughs> they, wanted, quite... they, wanted, they wanted me to be, you know, a doctor or an account, well, more a doctor actually, rather than an accountant. Um, so, but they were actually, I remember my mother saying that, Nicholas, it's all right if you do that because Roscoe, well, I think he's Jewish, isn't he? So, that's all right then. Yes, it was. It, yeah, it was all right because Roscoe was, you know, he had a Jewish dad. Little Nicky, little Nicky, little Nicky, You went to Capital. You were in the original lineup for Capital. I remember that as being a very exciting time. How was it for you? Oh, it was astonishing. I, I, I joining Capital. I joined on my twenty third birthday. September the 3rd, 1973, I walked into the building. This was before Capital moved into Euston Tower. They had an office in um, Piccadilly. I walked in with Roger Scott. We joined on the first day. And this was a dream come true. I mean, it was, it was amazing. We had three or four weeks of intense dry runs where the programme controller, Michael Bucked, um, who was the most wonderful man and who I, you know, loved and became a... He became one of my, my closest friends and mentors. He was just a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, Michael uh, dry ran the station for, as I say, a couple of weeks and we had to, you know, learn how... I remember his rule was, he said, there are basically two rules to this radio station. I want you to tell the truth and I want you to be real. And he said, there's only one person listening. Remember that there's only one person listening. Now on some radio stations I've worked in, that was literally the case, but, um, but, uh, that's so true. Cause it is such a one to, I mean, he said things like, um, when your listener is listening to you, they let you in to parts of their life that they wouldn't let their best friends in. Keep that in your head. And he made us, I remember this, he made us get a picture of someone that we loved and cared for. And he made us put it by the microphone. And he said, talk to this person this was on the dry runs talk to this person um and that's how you got it into your head that you're only talking to one person that there's only one person that you you would never hear me say hello everyone how are you i just it's i, I it goes against everything in my in my makeup to do that because it's not a group that's listening it's just one it's the intimacy thing again isn't it yeah. that you spoke about yeah which yeah. is such a powerful part of any radio whether it's speech or, or music i mean your show was called your mother wouldn't like it well chosen tell us a bit about the show um michael buck chose the title 
uh, Michael Butt said, I want you to do a rock show. Um, it's called Your Mother Wouldn't Like It. Um, you have a producer um, who, <laughs> a guy called Gary Beard, who had never produced a radio show in his life before. He came from the record department at Way In, which was part of Harrods at the time, uh, the cool bit of Harrods. Um, and Gary and I, we would plan the program, I mean plan, we would go into the record library every afternoon and we would literally pull albums from the shelves. I would always know what I was going to start with. So I'd walk into the studio with a pile of albums and I always knew what I was going to start with. And then the program just happened organically. Um, there was no running order. There was, you know, it wasn't planned in advance. Um, the only thing that I would plan in advance is if I was, if I were doing an interview, then I would, I would prep that and I would, you know, put some questions down. But even that, you know, I, I would just fly by the seat of my pants. Um, and I loved being able to listen to a track that was playing at that time live and then suddenly get an idea and say to Gary, why don't we play this? And Gary would run out to the record library and he'd come back with an album and I'd, you know, queue it up and put it on. It was the most exciting and wonderful uh, radio that in those early days of Capital. And Michael just allowed us to be us. There was no imposing format on us you know, this is how I want you to be. And I remember, I remember Michael, uh, you talk about what it was like for me in those early days. I was working with people like Kenny Everett and Dave Cash and David Simons, all of these people who were heroes to me. They were the next generation, or the, they were the previous generation. So these were the people that I really looked up to. So I was, I had a daily show with these people and after about four or five weeks of capital being on the air I had a real crisis of confidence I just felt that I wasn't pulling my weight I wasn't I wasn't worthy actually so I went to Michael and I said to Michael we sat I sat down in his office and I said look Michael I, I just don't think that I'm doing a really good job at the moment and I feel I feel like I'm not really part of the team. I feel like I'm like a small fish in a big pond and I'm I'm kind of drowning. And Michael Michael said to me Michael said to me and I'm going to use the exact words that he said, so you might have to beat this out, but these are the exact words that Michael said to me. Remember I'm twenty three. Michael said to me, Listen you little shit. I didn't hire you because you're a good DJ. I hired you because you're a nice bloke. Now fuck off and be a nice bloke on air. <laughs> that, Fantastic. That, that was my pep talk. <laughs> but Michael but wanted to you must have a, become you know, a good be, DJ. Be, 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 real, be real and tell the truth. You see, that's what he wanted. But, I mean, it sounds incredibly creative. Who were the who were the bands that you remember from that time that were kind of nurtured by your show or the individual artists? Um, I remember distinctly uh, the police coming in um, and doing their first radio session. I remember Elvis Costello and the Attractions. I remember Elvis Costello and the Attractions coming in and Elvis saying to me, because um, we had a big music studio um, at Capitol, you know, multi-track, 16-track um, multi-track um, recording studio, you know, with a proper, you know, professional Neve desk. It was, a, it was a fantastic setup. And Elvis came in and he said, I've written a song, he said, on the tube on the way up. He said, you know, can we rehearse it and do this song because no one's heard it. And I said, yeah, sure, it would be great. And the song was... Uh, Radio Radio, which was, um, you know, the lyrics are radio is in the hands of such a lot of fools trying to anaesthetize the way that you feel. 
Um, he wasn't having a go at me, uh, or Capital at the time, but um, I remember we played Eagles um, before anyone else. And I, rem I mean, bands like Eagles and their management have never, ever forgotten that to this day. We were the first to play Kate Bush as well. Um, and I, you know, even today, I'm very, very close to all of the, the band, you know, Don Henley and Joe Walsh particularly. And they've become friends over the years. You know, I went on the road with them. I went on the Hotel California tour with them. And that was because we, we kind of built the relationship. And it's not, as you say, Helen, not just the relationship that you build with your listener. It's the relationship that you build with the individuals in groups and with bands and management and to a certain extent record companies. Um, those relationships are incredibly important to this day and I don't think that uh, I don't think people kind of realize in radio I think realize how important those relationships are I think, you know, there was a time when record pluggers, particularly when I was at Radio 1, where record pluggers were sort of seen as a bit of a nuisance. Um, and, you know, there was a roster to let them talk to producers and things. Um, and there were some producers at Radio 1 at that time who welcomed them in. People like Peel and Walters and Tommy Vance and, you know, other, um, other presenters and producers. Um, but uh, sorry, I digress. But but it is but it is about those relationships. You're very relationship focused. I get the sense in the best possible way. How do you how did you select, as it were, the musicians and the acts that you kind of helped progress? Was it instinct? Just instinct. Just instinct, Helen. It was just ears. It was it was just listening. To I mean, a lot of um, pluggers would would give me acetates, first pressings, test pressings from various albums, um, and I would listen to them. and And if I liked them, we would book them, <laughs> and they'd come in and they'd do sessions. Or if they weren't available for sessions, if they were in America, I I mean, I remember going to America for the first time. Um, Warner Brothers paid for it, and I went to Burbank. Uh, to interview loads of their stars at the time. Uh, and then I, I flew to New York and I interviewed Aretha Franklin. I did a lot of their um, Atlantic um, artists. And I remember I was walking around the village and um, I picked up a, an album by a, a group called Hall of Notes, um, who hadn't been heard of uh, in this country. And the album was Abandoned Luncheonette. And I brought it back to London um, and at that time, um, Warners had no plans to release She's Gone as a single, which was the, the big hit. Um, and I played this from this import album. And I played it and played it and played it. And then eventually Warners went, oh, this sounds like a hit to us. Um, and they, they put it out. Um, but to, to answer your question, no, it, it just instinct just my ears it, if, if it appealed to me i think it would appeal to my listener and they trust you of course so they're going to give it a listen because it's that mutual trust that happens yeah um researching this i read some of the people you've interviewed you've interviewed an extraordinary range of people um you're very modest about the way you you couch it who's really stood out for you in terms of unexpectedness or surprise um learning uh i think well two people really um john lennon um i and i always mention this because this this shows what a human being john lennon was and this once again goes back to kenny Everett. i was at capital um I can't remember what night of the week it was, but anyway, I was on the air and suddenly the studio door burst open and Kenny Everett waltzes in and goes, hello, darling. He said, um, how would you like to go to, to New York to interview John? 
And I went, John who? He went, Lennon, silly Billy. And I went, okay. And Everett explained that Lennon had phoned him because they were great friends from the Radio London days and from Liverpool. So that they, they knew each other really well. So Lennon called Everett and said, look, I, I want to do this interview where I want to talk about some heavy stuff and about how the CIA are following me and how they're tapping my phones. Uh, and it's a heavy interview. And Everett went, oh, I don't do heavy interviews, love, but I know someone that does. <laughs> and um, so I said to Everett, you know, tell John that, you know, I'd love to do it. And a week later, I flew to New York and I found myself at the door of the Dakota, uh, which is the, the apartment building in New York where Lennon was living. And I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. He was my favourite Beatle. Um, and, you know, I was 23 and a half, 24. I'd, you know, I'd just been doing this show and, I, as I said previously, I'd had this crisis of confidence and here I am in New York about to interview John Lennon and he's going to talk to me about heavy stuff. Um, and I remember my hand was shaking so much I couldn't really knock on the door properly it was it was and the door opened and there was Lennon and my hand was up like this and he went how and I went how <laughs> and he said come in he said um it's lovely to see you lovely to meet you he said I, I've just baked some cookies he said it's not a not a, a, a bake mix it's not a Bessie Aunt Bessie bake mix it's like my own um, I've just made them for you. John Lennon's made me cookies. And he said, so come into the kitchen. And he took the cookies out of the, the oven. Um, he said, come come into the, the living room. And I'm sort of taking my tape recorder with me, this heavy Ewer tape recorder that I'd taken all the way across the Atlantic. Um, and he realised how terrified I was. He realised that I was really, really nervous. And we sat on the floor of this living room at the Dakota with white carpet, the white piano. The only thing in the color of color in the room was a brass telescope that looked out over the Hudson. And he warmed me up. Now, obviously, as you well know, the convention is that the interviewer warms up the interviewee. And then when you think that the interviewee is ready, you switch the tape recorder on and off you go. John Lennon reversed that and he warmed me up so that I was ready to do the interview. Now he'd done thousands of interviews. We'd never met before. And yet he took the time and the trouble to just be so empathic to me um, that he waited until I was ready. <laughs> to do the interview and then we did the most amazing interview where he talked about how the CIA were following him how they were messing around in the in the basement tapping his phones and I came back to London and I had this interview this amazing interview and I was roundly criticized for basically not pushing him enough um, when he was making these accusations um, and years later actually when um, the papers, the, the American government released the papers from that particular, um, that particular period. It was shown that the CIA were following him and they did tap his phones and they did try and stop him getting a green card. So that, you know, that was, he was amazing. He was absolutely amazing. And the other person um, who really was otherworldly and I, I became... Fortunately, you know, quite close to him over the years was David Bowie. Um, we met first at Top of the Pops when I was doing my Radio 1 beat and doing interviews for a program called Seen and Heard on Radio 1. So that's where we first met. But um, I, <laughs> I was flown to um, Canada to do an interview with him for Capital. And foolishly, foolishly, 
I said before I was flying out, I'm going to, I guess where I'm going tomorrow, I'm going to Toronto and I'm going to come back with this exclusive interview with David Bowie. And I said this on air. So I get to Toronto. Long story short, I'm with the head of RCA Records. We stay in Toronto for five days. We then fly to Detroit to try and get the interview, but we don't get the interview with David Bowie. It doesn't happen. We keep getting pushed back. It's, you know, he'll do it in an hour. He'll do it at the, before the gig. It doesn't happen. And I come back with my tail between my legs and my program controller, Aiden Day, um, was furious with me. Furious. He thought that I hadn't tried very hard to get the interview when actually I tried my hardest because Bowie is surrounded by all these people. Um, and I, I was severely, I was censured by this. And he thought that I brought the station to kind of embarrass the station because I had to go on the air and say, you know that interview that I was going to bring you? I haven't got it. Um, anyway, about four months later, I got a, a phone call late at night at home. And I pick up the phone. Uh, Hello, Nikki, it's David. David who? David Bowie. I mean, oh, who is it, really? No, it's David Bowie. Oh, OK. Hello, David. <laughs> Lovely to speak to you. Um, he said, look, I heard that you really got into big trouble over me not doing the interview with you in Canada. He said, I'm really sorry, he said, but, you know, I was, he was, he was very heavily into drugs at the time. And he said, look, I was just too spaced out to, to do it. He said, but I promise you, next time I'm in London, I will come to Capital and I will give you an exclusive interview. I won't do anyone else. I won't do the BBC. Um, and about a month later, I got a phone call and David Bowie came into that studio, the studio that night. He brought with him an enormous poster, which I don't actually have in this room because it's um, in a secure location. Um, but it's signed. It's a just a gigolo, the the poster for just a gigolo, with um, to Nikki lots of love, uh, and I'm sorry, David. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Um, and he came in to Capital that night with this present for me and just hugged me and said, look, I'm really, really sorry that, you know, you got into the shit over me. Um, and he gave me the most wonderful interview. And we subsequently, um, years later, when I was at Talk Radio, he, we did the first ever webcast together for Bowie Net. He was otherworldly, is I suppose the only way I can describe it. He, he just... He had this aura about him, um, and I was so fortunate, so incredibly lucky to build, we go back to this word again, uh, this relationship with him. So you've worked on so many different stations, some specialist music, some broad, you know, huge mass market. What are the key things you've always kept in mind? I think whichever format that I've ever worked on, I think the, the the Michael Bucked credo, you know, be real, tell the truth, be a nice guy. Um, I think you know it's it's those three rules, and you know, radio is radio. It doesn't matter what format you're on. You know, when I was on Classic FM for a program that you know remarkably. Um, won uh, a, a, a um, New York Radio Award. It was an uh, educational program called Masterclass. And I remember Michael Buck saying to me, because Michael was the program controller of, Capital, of uh, Classic FM as well as Capital, um, he said to me, you know, we're a rock station. We just play classical music. So do your thing with classical music. Um, and I said, look, Michael, I really don't know that much about classical music. He said, don't worry, love, no one here does. <laughs> and um, my wife uh, is a classically trained musician. She went to the Royal Academy um, and is a viola player. 
and for a while was a professional. Um, and I remember being on the air at um, Classic FM and um, I can't remember which piece I was playing, but I remember I was talking to Jenny on the phone because it was a very long piece and I was talking to my wife on the phone and she was listening because um, she loved Classic FM and the music they played. And, the, <laughs> and she said, hmm, tricky part, part for the bassoon there. And I said, look, sweetheart, I, I have to go because I'm going to do a link. And I put the phone down, I opened the microphone and went, hmm, tricky part for the bassoon there. <laughs> <laughs> and how is it to be on Boom Radio, which is such a brilliant idea? I love it on Boom. You know, I'd kind of given up on radio, um, on music radio anyway. Um, I, I still love speech radio very much. But I'd given up on music radio um, because it's so formatted. And, you know, I there were times when I was told what to to play and what to say and how long I had to say it in and how many times I had to say the name of the radio station and how many times I had to say the kind of tagline, you know, more music power or whatever inane phrase, puerile phrase it was. And I, I just uh, sob this. I just don't want to do this anymore. Um, and then David Lloyd, uh, who is one of the main architects of Boom Radio, called me and said, look, you know, we've got this idea for a, a radio station for baby boomers. Um, it's going to be a virtual radio station, so you'd be working from home. Um, you will have a great deal of freedom uh, to play what you want within, you know, a specified kind of parameters. Um, you will be talking to a boomer. Um, how do you feel about that? Um, and I said, I think it's a really great idea. And Phil Riley, who is the managing director, um, I knew Phil and I knew what he'd done in radio and I knew how you know, successful he had been in radio stations. And I, I respected and respect David Lloyd immensely for his radio expertise and I actually felt and I knew that Graham Dean was going to be part of it and so Graham and I went out for very long walks on Hampstead Heath <laughs> that sounds like a metaphor but it's not uh, we went for very long walks on Hampstead Heath Graham and I um, and talked about it and you know he had also become very disillusioned with radio and we just felt that, you know, we'd, we'd give it a go. Um, and I love it. I love what I do on Boom. I've rediscovered my love for the medium. I think that being here in this room, you know, surrounded by my stuff, um, helps my kind of, and we go back to intimacy again, uh, it helps my intimacy because I'm in my space, I'm not in someone else's studio, this is my space, you know, I've got, you know, my wife and downstairs, my granddaughter, you know, there have been times when that door has opened, when there's been a knock on the door, and Pearl, who is, you know, two and a half, you know, would Pop, pop, what are you doing? And I, this has been when I've been, you know, doing links. But what are you doing, pop, pop? Oh, I'm Pearl, I'm on the radio. And she'd come and sit here on my lap and, um, you know, watch what I was doing. Um, you know, there have been times when, you know, Jenny, as I mentioned, my wife is a classical musician. She has a string quartet. And, you know, during the summer, they would be they would play in our garden so you know if the window was open you know you could hear the sound of a you know Haydn string quartet or a Mozart string quartet um, coming through uh, from the back garden um, this is my environment and I, I I love I love being on boom I, I love the response that I'm getting or the fact that we're all getting 
um, is incredible. I haven't seen this kind of response to a radio station, any radio station I've worked in, since the early days of Capital. You know, when we would get tons of post and postcards and people would come into the foyer. If Boom Radio had a foyer like Capital, it would be packed every day. And why do you think that is? <laughs> I think simply it's about that connection again. I think that we have made a connection with our listener. I think our listener has felt disenfranchised by other radio stations who are continually targeting younger people. Um, no names, no pack drill, but uh, we know who we're talking about. We do. BB BBC Local Radio has by and large ignored that audience that was core to their listenership and as I think to an extent ignored the, the, the localness of its offering, which I think is a big mistake um, because I think local radio is so terribly important when it's done well. Um, but I think Boom has made this connection with our listener. I think we're giving them not just a sense of nostalgia, because I, I didn't want to work on a... I told David that I didn't want to work on a mausoleum. You know, no one wants to work on a mausoleum. Um, you know, I wanted to play new music, a new music that I thought would appeal to my listener. Um, and we're doing that. Maybe not as much as I would like, but we're doing that. Um, and I just think the way that we talk about things, the, the focus that we have is unlike any other radio station. You know, I, I couldn't give the focus, I couldn't do the links I do on any other radio station other than Boom. So that to me is a, an absolute revelation. So to anyone who's never listened to it on this website, what would your message to them be? And they're likely to be boomers like us. Um, my message to anyone who hasn't listened to this radio station is you have a home. You have a home at Boom. You will hear music that you haven't heard on any radio station for a very long time. It will bring back some wonderful memories for you. We will talk about things that resonate with you. You know, I will talk about my grandchild. I will talk about, you know, my, my wife. But I will also talk about, you know, what I did when I was a hippie. Because as a boomer, you were probably a hippie too. <laughs> so, you know... Come home to Boom. Vicky, That's thank you message. very much. You're very welcome, Helen. It's lovely to talk to and you. And you. Music for our generation.